Monitor Darkly here. Today we're going to be looking at a lock that I've wanted to get my hands on for quite a while now. This is the Zeiss Icon System M. For those unaware, this lock is the equivalent to the first generation AVA MCS. And my particular model has a few minor design differences from what you normally see on the System M, which we'll go over, but for all intents and purposes, the System M and the MCS Gen 1 are the same lock. I've heard a couple of contradicting stories on how the System M and the MCS relate to each other. I've heard that Zeiss Icon was the original creator of this lock and it was eventually sold to Ava, who later created its successor, the MCS. I've also heard that Zeiss Icon and Ava collaborated on this design and each sold their own version until Zeiss Icon stopped producing theirs. I was talking to Captain Hook number one about this and he was able to find a very old newspaper article referenced in a history book about the secret tools used by the Stasi. And this article confirms that Zeiss Icon was the original sole designer for the System M, indicating that this was indeed the predecessor to the MCS and not a collaborative effort. So a big thank you to Captain Hook number one for somehow pulling an answer to that incredibly arcane question out of thin air. Apart from that little history lesson, there's a great deal to talk about with this lock. Just about every aspect of it is unique in one way or another. I could easily make a two hour long video on it. I'm not gonna do that though. I'm gonna give more of a broad overview and even that's gonna take a little while. If you wanna get into the fine details of the MCS, I highly recommend checking out Lockfall Laboratories channel. He was the first to pick the MCS and he's also the inventor of the picking, picking technique we'll be using. His channel has at least four or five videos discussing just about everything there is to know with this lock. He goes over exactly how every piece works, his picking technique, and even disassembly tips. I strongly urge anyone who's considering taking one of these apart to carefully study the latter. This is a highly complex lock and you really don't want to go digging into this without knowing exactly what you're doing. So the System M at its heart is a magnetic rotor lock. Now what does that mean? Simply put, this lock has two sidebars, one on each side. And these sidebars are blocked from moving by four magnetic rotors. And these rotors spin like a wheel on an axle, and they're set by magnets on the key. And these magnets aren't just your normal north-south polarity. Rather, they're magnetized in differing sections on their surface. And when the key is inserted, these magnets cause the rotors to rotate into their correct position in order for the sidebars to align into their true gates. And I know that sounds complicated, but when we take a look at the internals, it will make a little more sense. So when I said this is a highly complex lock, this is what I was talking about. Each sidebar system has several different elements, so I've completely disassembled one and left the other alone so we can see how all of these things work together. So first we have the sidebar, and this is what interacts with the lock housing and prevents the lock from turning. And next we have this little plate cover that kind of acts as a go-between between the sidebar and the rotors, prevents them from misaligning their gates and things like that. Once the rotors are all aligned correctly, the sidebar is able to slide forward and the lock is able to turn and this little spring in here retracts it to its uh, original position. And when I insert my pick, we can get a better idea of the concept I was talking about earlier. We can see the magnet actually spins these rotors in order to align to the gate. The reason I'm not using the key for this is because otherwise this will fly out at me. And moving back to the key, we also have these little cutouts on the edge that uh, allow the passive ball bearings to pass freely. I mentioned earlier as well that my particular lock is a bit different from what you normally see on the System M's and the MCS's. And that's because this is actually an older design that's not seen as often. In the newer models, the entire sidebar system is actually even more complex. Rather than just this spring to reset the sidebar, there's actually these collar rings at the front and back of the plug that help guide the sidebar forward and backward. Additionally, there's a plastic cover between the sidebar and the rotor cover plate that's notoriously difficult to remove without damaging it. I've been told these parts were added in in order to prevent some sort of bypass attack. 
I wasn't able to find out what that was exactly, but we can say that it doesn't affect the picking technique normally used for these. And it's a shame that they had to make these design changes because this design is by far more efficient and easier to disassemble and reassemble. And moving back to the plug, we can see the passive ball bearings. And these don't protrude into the keyway until the plug is turned far enough to align with the these pins in the housing here. And these are located down the middle. Also in the housing, we can see the grooves and milling that interact with the sidebar to prevent the lock from turning. Finally, we have this active ball bearing, which like many other sidebar locks is just meant to provide plug stability and in this case, key retention as well, which is why the key blade has this little notch at the end. Picking the System M like most other magnetic locks is all about sound. However, the sound we're talking about here is so faint that we're gonna need some extra help. So we're gonna be using this acoustic guitar pickup, a pocket amplifier, and a pair of headphones. What all this does is allows us to clearly hear the minute sounds that we'll need to interpret in order to pick this. Additionally, I'll be using this magnetic pick that I recently used with the Miwa 3800. This is just a two by one millimeter neodymium magnet super glued onto the end of a broken pick. And I've also made markings on the pick so I could tell which rotor I'm working on there. And finally, I'll be using this Peterson hook number four and 25 thousandths to set the ball bearing and uh, the Z bar for tension, as well as some magnetic shielding, which we'll go over in a little bit. So to start, once we have our tension wrench in place, the first thing we need to do is set the ball bearing. And once we do that, we can see we have a nice deep false set. You shouldn't have any issues with your tension wrench blocking the passive bearings since they don't come into play until they're aligned with the passive drivers located down the center of the housing. And this doesn't occur until you've turned the plug a little bit over 45 degrees and the lock will be very open at that point. Now that we have the ball bearing set, we're gonna place the magnetic shielding against the opposite row of rotors that we'll be picking. And we'll need to switch the shielding from one side to another, depending which side we're working on so that we don't undo any of our work here. So the picking principles behind the system M are pretty basic, but very difficult to get the hang of. So with tension on the lock, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move the magnetic pick over each rotor and see what we hear. If we hear clicking noises, that means the rotor is either set or not yet binding and we can move on. If we don't hear anything, that means the rotor is binding and we have to work on it. What we'll do when that happens is back off tension and move the pick around a little bit, being careful not to go too far forward or back to avoid disturbing the other rotors. Then we'll reapply tension and test for sound again. If we hear clicking, that means we've set the rotor and we can move on. If not, we just need to try again, repeating as necessary until we get that clicking sound. And as you pick this, you'll learn to tell the difference between the various sounds. A set rotor is gonna give you a nice crisp clicking. A rotor that's spinning freely, freely is not yet binding and will sound a bit different. The best way I can describe that sound is uh, imagine having a marble inside of a metal cup and you're slowly gyrating the cup around in a circle, allowing the marble to roll around the along the bottom edge of the cup. And that's kind of what it sounds like to me anyway. An easy way to get a feel for that sound is to just spend some time manipulating the rotors without any tension applied and that'll tell you what it sounds like. So picking the rotors is not an exact science at all. It's pretty much just spinning each one around until you happen to find the gate. It can be a time consuming process. You're gonna be hearing a lot of other noises when picking like the lock pick scraping against the keyway and even your shielding jiggling around. So it's important to learn to filter that stuff out. And this is especially true with the shielding. You'll find that the noise of the shielding jiggling around can be very similar to the sound of a set rotor, so don't let it fool you. And make sure your shielding is nice and snug in the keyway, and don't be afraid to hold it down with a finger while you're doing your sound tests. One issue you'll probably run into is when you're backing off tension to manipulate a rotor, and you'll go just a little bit too far and drop the ball bearing. If and when this happens, you'll need to be mindful of how you handle it, because when this occurs, you'll have your magnetic pick in the lock without any tension, meaning that you're at risk of moving any rotors that you've already set on that side. So you'll wanna to try to do some damage control. 
If, for example, this happens when you're working towards the middle or back of the lock, you'll want to try and reset the bearing with your magnetic pick so that you don't have to pull it out, thereby scrambling any rotors that you've previously set. If, however, you drop the ball bearing while working towards the front of the lock, you don't want to go sticking your magnetic pick in there looking for the ball bearing because then again you're going to scramble stuff while trying to work your way in. You want to take your magnetic pick out and go back to using your hook. So it's a good idea to spend some time practicing your tension so that you can get a feel of how far you're able to safely counter rotate. With that in mind too it's also important to make sure you have full tension applied unless you're specifically manipulating a rotor. Finally, your magnetic pick movement is going to play a huge role here. It's important to be very conscious of how you're moving your pick in order to spin the rotors. If you've tried to set a rotor six or seven times and it's just not happening, try moving your pick in a different way. For example, I use a sort of rhythm when picking this. I'll do rapid back and forth movements when testing for sound, followed by a circular motion when trying to set a rotor, and I'll alternate back and forth between those. If I'm having trouble with the rotor, I'll try things like circling the pick in the opposite direction or maybe even some up and down or side to side movements. And on that note as well, make sure your rotor markings on your pick are accurate. Okay, hopefully you've stuck with me this long because now we can finally get to picking this. So for this, I, uh, can, I'm going to be doing a voiceover for this section for you. I don't particularly like doing this, but in this case I didn't really have a choice since uh, while picking this I had to have my headphones in and listen very carefully for sound, so I didn't want to go distracting myself. So to start, uh, like we mentioned earlier, I'm putting on the pickup and setting the ball bearing to start and then putting in the magnetic shielding. I'm going to start on the left side. And again, like I mentioned, I'm doing my rhythm pattern, doing back and forth motions for my sound test. So that's the best movement to find that good clicking sound. If I remember right, I didn't end up finding any binders on the left side, so I moved over to working on the right side rotors pretty quickly. So it looks like I'm working on rotor one on the right there. I drop my ball bearing right away. I think that's the only time I do that, so not too bad. And like I mentioned earlier too, I'm holding down that shielding with one finger while I test for sound just because it's so easy to mistake the shielding jiggling around for a set rotor. And that's especially true when working on the front rotors because the magnetic shielding is actually magnetic, so it tends to stick to the magnet at the end of my pick there. And right now it looks like I'm working on rotor two. And this is one of the more stubborn ones. Looks like I got that one set though. Now I'm working on rotors three and four on the left and it's very difficult to get both of those to stay set at the same time. They just the way that they're uh, magnetized, they just tend to interfere with each other when you're trying to set one. So you'll see me going back and forth between three and four several times here.
it looks like I'm finally happy with where three and four are at. And I'm doing a final sound test, holding down the shielding just to be sure. And it looks like everything's good on the right side there, so I'm going to switch back over to the left. Looks like rotor four on the left is binding there. I got him set without too much trouble. I'm working on three now. I think one and two are already good. So I'm happy with everything on the left, so I'm going back over to the right and this will happen, you'll have to go reset things that you've already set just because the magnetic shielding isn't completely foolproof. It's still possible for the magnetic pick to move something through the shielding and also the rocking back and forth of the plug when you're manipulating rotors is actually enough to unset some things. And so it looks like uh, three and four became unset of course, so I'm gonna have to go back and forth between those to get those set again. Working on four right now. Looks like four is set, and I'm working on three. And that one's an open. That's actually the quickest I've ever picked this, so I got lucky there. So now comes the fun part of disassembly, which, as I mentioned, it can be complicated if you don't know what you're doing. I was taking the sir clip off. I actually had to take that sir clip from my scrap pile. So when I cut this Euro lock in half, it actually didn't have one on there for some reason. Normally that wouldn't be a huge deal, but in the case with this lock, if you don't have a sir clip on the back and you apply tension after setting the ball bearing, the lock will actually uh, the plug will slide forward and allow it to turn because that's how the sidebars operate. They just slide forward a little bit. So I had to put the sir clip on there just to make sure everything was on the up and up. So to get the plug out is probably one of the harder parts. You have to start by depressing the ball bearing and pulling it a little bit forward. And then you have to keep doing that with this one because the ball bearing will then get snagged on the two uh, passive driver pins. So you got to keep depressing the ball bearing with each pin to slide it out a little more and more. And I know with other System M's and AVA MCS models, you'll have to probably go in towards the back after the initial plug slide out to depress some driver pins for the active ball bearing and passive pins. So... So keep that in mind, and again, check out Lockfile Laboratories' uh, channel for more detail on that, but that's how this particular one works. So I got the uh, driver pins and springs out for the active ball bearing as well as the passive ones. So now I'm taking the sidebars off, and this is another part you have to be really careful because you saw earlier there's that spring at the tip, and if you just try to yank the sidebar out, you'll risk having that spring fly God knows where. So what you want to do is kind of tip the back part of the 
sidebar outwards and then slowly let it release the spring tension and then you can pull it out. So now I'm dumping out the rotors. Actually, those are two little metal inserts. I forgot to go over those when I was talking about the internals. There's these two tiny little metal inserts on each side that I'm guessing they're for drill protection, but I'm not entirely sure since they're so small and they don't look like the type of metal that would prevent drilling, so I'm not sure what those are for. They're not magnetic, so I don't think it interacts with the locking mechanism in any way. And those magnetic rotors obviously are magnetic, so you got to be careful and not let them jump together like they're doing there. I think those ended up being mixed up, actually. I had to resort those before I locked it back up. And again, I'm tipping the back part of the sidebar out just a little bit. Letting it slide downward and gently release the spring tension before removing it completely. There's not really a good way to get those rotors out without having them jump together unless you use a bigger tray like I did when I was filming the internals part, which I should have done here, obviously. And again, removing those little, presumably drill insert pieces. And there's all the rotors. And here's a close up of the plug. Give you guys a close up of the sidebars. And I forgot to show the back of the sidebar during the internal, so sorry about that. Those little prongs are what uh, fit into the gates on the rotors there. And the other sidebar. And a close-up of the body. And last but not least, a close-up of the rotors and everything. I hope you've enjoyed this video on the Zeiss Icon System M. Feel free to leave any questions or comments you may have. And until next time, take care and thanks for watching.